Hey guys, it is December 10th, 2017, and this is your episode 124 of At Percussion. I'm your host, Casey Cangelosi, and with me as always are my friends, Megan Arms. Hello. And Ben Charles. Hi, everybody. Laurel is here, but she is just finishing up with a dress rehearsal, so she'll be in probably in 15, 20 minutes, something like that. So how's everybody doing? How's the end of the semester going? It's good. It's crazy. Just like giant rush to the end, you know? I don't know if you guys have the exact same thing, but it's like, yeah, it's always insane. But it's it's helpful knowing that there's a break right around the corner. So so, so does yours ramp up, Megan? Because I always feel like mine mellows out. Like, yeah, juries are long. We just had ours yesterday. It was a good five and a half hours or so. But it's kind of a playful day. Like we're mm-hmm. we're all just eating snacks together, and we're talking with the students, and every, everyone's generally really happy. And of course, it's a long day, but it's I don't know. Yeah, I feel like the big concerts are over, and everything kind of just settles into finals week. Yeah, that's true. And I usually try to front load the semester, you know. So we try to have percussion ensemble concert before PASIC. We do. I try to do my big projects here at the beginning of the semester. And I try to encourage recitals to be like early or mid semester before, you know, big concert weeks. So, yeah, I think I think ours kind of ramps down too. I think because the students have so much academic work at the end, I like feel their stress, you know, so I oh, kind of yeah. get everyone through. Um, That's a good but, point. Yeah, for me, I guess. And, and, you know, like the rec letter, there are tons of rec letters and we had alarm sound on campus last week. So that was really crazy for us. This semester has been a little different, but I'm with you. I think we usually t- kind of ramp down also. I'll try to view it that way. Wind down, ramp yeah. up. Yeah. Ben, you just look mad. <laughs> I, I, for last night for the first time in a very long time, I just, I slept and it was glorious. <laughs> I'm not doing that much lately, but we'll reveal those reasons later. Good news. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think the secret's out, but it's okay. We'll say for real later. But let's talk about our guests. You guys, our guests today are owners of Artifact Percussion. Established in 2014, Artifact creates professional percussion products that are not only handmade at the highest level of craftsmanship, but are also affordable and accessible for percussionists at every level. They believe in encouraging even the most inexperienced performers by offering them access to instruments, sticks, mallets, and accessories that are made for a lifetime of use. I met these guys when Aaron was studying at Temple University about two years ago, and if you, if anybody out there is familiar with some of my compositions, you might know a snare drum solo. It's a very visual piece for snare drum and playback that's called Tap Oratory. So Aaron is the person that commissioned that piece those years ago. So hello and welcome to Aaron Trumbor and Lexi Fiorini. How are you guys doing? Thank you. Great to be here. We're doing well. Yeah. So wh- where are you guys coming from? Tell us a little bit about what you've been doing since PASIC. Uh, sure. So, in terms of what we're doing with our life, or what Artifact's doing? <laughs> oh yeah. I guess they're, they're uh, one and the same. Any, this or, point, any or both. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, since PASIC, we've uh, definitely been very, very busy. Uh, you were just talking about a very little amount of sleep. That's we're definitely on the same page with you about that. Uh, just because of how much we have, we very much have taken off a lot more since PASIC. We've seen a big uptick in orders and custom orders and all kinds of different projects that Artifact is undertaking at the moment. Um, you know, because we're both also working, you know, I teach at a private school and uh, Lexi works full time, too. So, you know, we're both basically working full time jobs and then we get home, eat dinner and then the second eight hour shift starts. Of artifact. So, you yeah. know, we're, we're, we're on the, you know, 1 a.m., 2 o'clock in the morning, like almost every night just working on artifact stuff. Um, and we have our weekends to do it as well, too. So. It's not quite at the point where we can hang up other, you know, work stuff yet. So that's that's where we're at right now with things. Yeah, sure. So I always hear that debate with companies. They ask, is PASIC a good idea? Because it, it's expensive to go to PASIC, of course. But it sounds like from your perspective, PASIC was very important, right? Yeah, I mean, as a smaller new business, I think it's I think it's really important. You know, I I heard that grumble a lot from a lot of the bigger companies who go every year and have been going every year for so long. You know, um, 
you know, they're, 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 them, them talking about, you know, it's really expensive for us to get our booth and it's really hard to keep doing this every year uh, financially because they, they really just break even on what they're doing, you know. Um, mm. But I think for new businesses like us, I think it's really great because we were finally able to put so many faces to all these names of people who have been buying from us and meeting, uh, you know, meeting some of our artists who we haven't met yet, who were all about wanting to just, you know, play with all, all of our gear exclusively and just having that opportunity to, uh, to get one-on-one -on -one FaceTime with all these great people um, who we've been interacting with for the past year, but, you know, haven't had a chance to meet. So for us, it was really great. Yeah. That sounds very much like what Jason Ginter said about PASIC. Oh yeah. yeah, 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 absolutely. And you know, and we work with Jason on some stuff too. He's a good friend, very good cool. friend of mine. Yeah. Cool, cool, cool. I always think, oh man, I could not work on the floor for very uh, long. Yeah, actually, you know, it's funny. Yeah, yeah. Lexi wasn't Lexi wasn't out there this year. It was just me. Um, but yeah, I mean, you like that by the end of the first day, I was actually really afraid that I was going to not be able to talk the second day because I. All I did was nonstop talk for those yeah. eight hours. <laughs> Just one person after the other, after the other coming up to you. So it's like my voice was shot after the end of the first day. And I was like, oh, crap, I'm going <laughs> to I'm, I'm not going to be able to talk to anybody tomorrow because you're like yelling over top of all the noise the whole time. Yeah. Did you so, feel like the uh, noise was better? The noise level was better this year? Did, did you I like the so. setup? I think so. The div the divider wall, there was a huge I mean, there's a huge debate about that. Some people really loved it. Others really hated it. But. I think the divider wall was really helpful for, for the noise level, at least. Yeah. yeah. I've, I've heard that some people didn't like it, but I never have heard anyone say that. I've just heard whispers that some people did not. Do you know what that complaint was? I can't imagine some any negative some thing of the, to this. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Some of the other vendors, you know, were complaining because it kind of cut them off from other things going on, you know. And people had to snake their way all the way through the hall to get to them, you know, instead of. Oh, right. Yeah, that's it was more of a it was more of an exposure. Yeah. Thing. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like Lexi said, it's more of a visibility thing than a sound thing. Oh, right. Because yeah. if you were the first, like the early you are in the row. Yeah. The more yeah, likely like the, the that, early you know, are in the path, the more likely you are to like everyone's going to see you. I, yeah. I feel like that's how it is. Go ahead, I feel sorry. like that's how it is every year anyway. Like the like Yamaha and Malatek are always right at the front. Like they get a ton of exposure because of that. But you can but you can like cut past things and yeah, as yeah. opposed to like because this was set up more like IKEA where yeah but like at the same rate this did it I thought it, it like weaved you through like all the different businesses like there were some like the uh, freer percussion booth I thought would have been really easy to miss unless I was actually like on a path that went right by it which oh, I oh I get it I get it. You're right. It kind of was like IKEA. I like that. Yeah. But if you're if you're looking at the exhibit hall before you enter, the right side was, you know, the big instruments and the big companies. I wonder, and that wasn't a maze. So I wonder if they just set up that left side. Uh -huh. You know, the sheet music, the smaller companies, the mallets, um, keyboard instruments, like in that same way. So it was more of like a, a grid, yeah. than, than a snake. I wonder if that would be better. Maybe they should have a snake pit. <laughs> like Indiana Jones. Well, I don't know about the snake pit, but there should be snacks. There should be more snacks in that exhibit hall. A snack pit? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you, just dive, you, dive in and you, you dive in and whatever you come back That's out it. with is what you come out with. Yeah, yeah. I Man, I, I've got ideas, I think. This is hardcore percussion journalism right here. It is. Like, like, it is. Uh, you know like what though? Jokes. It's still it's still damn better than actual journalism out there. Oh my god, I'm so exhausted. <laughs> it's so one of my favorite one of my personal favorite things about this show is all the tangents you guys get off on with your go with your guests. Yeah, <laughs> Ben. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. You watch Game of Thrones, Aaron? <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah, we're, we're yeah, big Game of Thrones. Yeah. Thrones see, yeah. see guys, I told you all our guests. <laughs> it's not true. You only say that when someone says yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's time for a question. What do you think, Ben? <laughs> sure. So we had uh, quite a few pretty similar Facebook questions. So I, most of them I was able to sort of compile into two. Um, so we'll start with uh, this one today. And it's from Larry Pugh, Alyssa Resch. 
Alessandra Ocampos all would like to know about founding Artifact Percussion. Could you tell us what inspired you to start a company, such as what segment of the market you didn't think was being served? What business skills did you pick up along the way? And did you directly or indirectly study any other business models? Wow. Okay, great. Yes. Um, <laughs> I'll try to take that take that in pieces. Um, I guess the first one we'll start with, you know, how we started and where kind of the inspiration came from that. Um, well, Lexi and I are both we're both drummers, both percussionists. Um, you know, I did both of my degrees, my undergrad and my master's in performance. So um, I do a lot of freelancing and playing and teaching and all that good stuff. Um, and I am also a big gearhead, and so is Lexi. Like we collect gear, like. It's a problem. Uh, <laughs> um, so, you know, being big gearheads and we like to make our own stuff. And we, we have been, I've been doing it for a long time, um, for many years before we actually felt comfortable enough to start selling any of it to anybody. Um, and the inspiration for Artifact itself, like the, our, our name and all that. Do you, you want to take, you want to take that? Yeah. Answer? Um, Go ahead. I mean, I'm, I have a degree in history, and so I have a background in that. I, it's, I really love history, and I, because we're gearheads, I've spent a lot of time going through catalogs, you know, and just, you know, we've collected a lot of vintage and antique gear, tambourines, drums, and I, I don't know, there's just something about the way that that stuff was made, and, and even the way that it was marketed, um, that we've, I think we've, we've lost that a little bit and uh, artifact and the, the name and, and also a lot of what we're trying to do, it was really inspired by incorporating more of percussion history into the industry. Um, yeah. One of our things, you know, we like to say a lot too, is like, we're kind of inspired by the past, which we are, you know, um, we're really, really into that. And we want to bring some of those elements kind of back into the, into the forefront for sure. And so, um, what was the next part of that question? So, you know, that, as far as the inspiration for Artifact, that's that's where that came from. The inspiration so, to start our business, yeah. Before before we move on to the next part, could you tell us like about some of these like because uh, like one of my favorite things is the old Deegan catalogs. Could you tell yeah. us about some of your favorite sort of classic products or advertisements that you came across? Oh sure, yeah. Well, I mean, uh, to give you an example too, um, like if you look at like any of the old Leedy catalogs with all their old, really amazing drumstick designs, and it's so hard to even get your hands on any of those drumsticks from like the 20s, 30s, 40s, that era. You know, if you come across them, like any of like the old Leedy Super Balance stuff and things like that, um, you know, we we take a lot of the older stick designs and kind of put them into into what we're doing with like our sticks. Um, you know, the way the stick is shaped, things like that, the way it's tapered. You know, and also kind of bringing some new elements into it too. That's you know, that's that's really what, what we like to do with all the stuff that we're we're doing is kind of mixing some of the old with you know our own new, more modern ideas or what the more modern player is looking for too, um, in terms of the, the sound that they want and the, the implement that they're looking for. Um, do you have anything yeah. to add to that? I mean, in terms of specific, like yeah, go ahead. You're you're more <laughs> you're more into that. She's yeah. Lexi's more into all that stuff um, than. But I am. Okay. I mean, I'm spending more, more of my time making everything, and she's the one doing all the research. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. One of our more recent acquisitions, um, we found uh, on eBay, we found a, a WFL uh, dreadnought drum from 1945. One of the drums that were made uh, while medals were limited during World War II, and um, it, so I did a. It, it actually took me a while to find that page from that catalog um but that's probably one of my favorites in terms of just imagery and like um and and we're well it's it's in the process of being taken apart now and and refurbished and just take as i'm taking it apart like the, the craftsmanship on it um is just really incredible and all the wooden lugs that were just clearly handmade for that drum and the functionality of it is yeah i mean that's i love that but yeah <laughs> yeah absolutely and and kind of and, and bringing back that more of a handmade feel to things instead of churning out giant you know batches of stuff at one time you know we we're something that i think a lot of our most of our customers understand this but some of them are kind of learning is that you know we are we very much make everything to order if you're placing an order for anything with us you know we're taking the time to to make it to order for you 
um, then we're not just pulling it off of a shelf and throwing it in a box and sending it on its way. But uh, sometimes I want like 80 mallets. <laughs> well, we're not there yet. <laughs> you can you can help us get there. <laughs> uh, we're, we're, we're yeah. I mean, we're not we're not quite at that point yet. I mean, oh, things are moving in that direction though. I mean, they they're they're coming fast and furious, almost to the point where we, it's it's um, dare I say like almost at an unmanageable level for us. Um, yeah. It's it's getting that busy. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's cool. Congrats. That's great. Yeah. I was going to yeah. ask, speaking of Lexi's interest in history and her history degree, have you guys been to the Rhythm Discovery Center? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yep. It, I, I was there in 2014. <laughs> oh, let us behind the glass, as they call it? Yes. Have you been behind the glass? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you did Rob. Did Rob uh, Funkhauser take you on the on the tour? Was it the, uh, the curator? He's one of the, he's like the main curator there. Really nice guy. He's a very jolly I, dude. I, met, I, I did meet Rob. I know Rob, but it was, um, yeah, so Josh took us behind the glass, and we got to see just how many things they have. And, oh, man, it was just what, what, I, what I would love to see them do. I mean, this is so much to ask. And it's a huge project. They have so many famous people going through there, and they have these practice rooms, and they have all these instruments. Wouldn't it be so cool, you know, next time, I don't know, pick your – your favorite famous percussionist next time so-and-so is there they pull out you know the black beauty and shoot a video with that person performing something that would have been played on that instrument at that yeah. time wouldn't that be cool absolutely be yes <laughs> yeah i think that'd be so cool i mean it'd be hard to do you know they want to preserve these things but it'd be so neat to to hear them even if we can't hear them you know exactly like they they were yeah, for yeah. sure, and 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 that's one of the things that we that we really love. Aside from you know making the mallets and sticks that we're currently selling, is like doing like refurbished projects and doing that kind of stuff, especially with drums. And specifically for me, with you know one of my big loves and passions is tambourines. I have such a huge collection, and I just got this other really cool one. It's a it's a big twelve inch leady tambourine from the '30s, and it's it's incredible and super rare. And to have all the jingles intact, I mean. I'm always hunting on eBay and Craigslist and all these places for all this really cool stuff because, you know, sometimes people are getting rid of it at such because they don't know what they have and they list it as something weird. Like we found that Lady Dreadnought and it's one of how many made? I I don't know, uh, but I, it's it's the only under a hundred of seen. them made. I mean, <laughs> absolutely yeah. less than a hundred of them made. It's the only one in real life that we've ever been able to find. Like not even a picture of it other than like the the, the, the very the faded catalog. yeah the very faded catalog drawing, but. You know, the guy had it listed as like what, like old wooden drum or something. Right, and it was you know, like yeah. like like you wouldn't have been, you wouldn't have found it if you were looking for Lady Dreadnought, you know, because no yeah. one knows what that stuff is. Like if they if they pulled it out of their grandfather's basement or their estate and they're getting rid of it and old yeah. wooden drum, you know, and it's yeah. and you pay a hundred bucks for it, it's easily worth like right. it's it's priceless in yeah. my in my opinion just because of the. I, I think that's something sort of unique to percussion too is that we're using instruments. And I mean, this is true for for instruments in general, I think. But um, you know, there are there are schools that have hundred year old Deegan marimbas that they're they're still using, they're still performing with, um, and I think that's amazing because there's not a lot of industries where something that's a hundred years old is still relevant today um, and is still you know fully functional, if not more desired than what's what's currently being produced. So. Yeah. Yeah, this uh, this all brought a, a couple of thoughts to me. One was if anyone goes back and listens to our Emil Richards episode, Emil had this great story about finding just this like priceless, like gi gigantic singing bowl, and he went to some sort of like flower shop and they had a tree sitting in this thing, and he was like, "How much for the brass piece?" <laughs> they gave it to him for like a hundred bucks, and he said, "Like, yeah, right. he, he's like." Try, like trying to yank this thing out the door before someone like figures out like what kind of steel he just had. And they're like, wait, wait, sir, excuse us, excuse us. Uh, this this came with it, and it was like the beater for it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He's <laughs> like, and, oh, and, yeah, God. absolutely. One of the most interesting things I've ever seen at PASIC was this year, uh, Freer released George Hamilton Green Xylophone Mallets. And so they actually got from George Hamilton Green's family his mallet bag, and it had some, you know, full mallets, and they were his, what is it, 16 inches or whatever the specification he gives in his book. And they found some extra 
like the extra heads in the bottom of the bag and they like ground them up and like analyze what the materials were and they made actual George Hamilton Green's signature xylophone mallets and they got his family's approval to use his name on them. So yeah, yeah. very very cool like historical stuff. So they like took the DNA from the mallet. Exactly. It was actually preserved in amber. <laughs> right. That's what I thought. <laughs> what was that we were talking about, Steve? What was the, that that uh, post on that, gosh, what was the name of that website? But we're, we're um, clapping music performed with Steve Reich's original hands. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, so do you guys have, I feel like you have a lot of competition when you're looking, on, not, not for your company, but um, as instrument collectors. Um, is there a large population of instrument collectors? And for example, when you're searching for things on YouTube, or not on YouTube, sorry, on eBay, do you have to, are you kind of like hawks on eBay or do you have notifications set or are you constantly yeah, yeah. All, yeah, all, find all something? Do you, are you like, oh, we have to buy this right now? Yeah. Yeah. Usually that's how, usually that's how it is. Yeah. I mean, yeah, all, definitely all of the Fine. above on that. And I'm, I usually, I, I usually am checking daily, you know, um, like I'll, I make it part of my like morning email routine, you know, while I'm, <laughs> while I'm doing all my artifact emailing, I'll also just kind of check that stuff out too. Yeah, yeah, it's very much a daily routine. Yeah, cool. sure, sure. You know, one more question in that that batch from Larry Pa, Alyssa Resch, and Alessandra Acampos. Yeah, please. What business skills did you pick up along the way? Did you directly or indirectly study any other business models? Great. Yeah, yeah, because I want to make sure we're we're also answering people's questions. Because <laughs> yeah, like I said, we like we could we could talk about all this, especially old vintage gear. I could talk about it. That's a whole other episode. Um, yeah, we've pulled ahead. we've pulled a lot from other industries, and and I think that's something um, that's made us pretty successful in terms of reach, like on social media um, and marketing. Just. Yeah, taking ideas from from other small businesses and other industries. Well, you know, we'll see an ad and say, "Oh, I like, I really like the way that's set up," and and do our own version of it. Um, yeah, and a, a huge part of it too. A huge part of running a business, at least half, if not more, is all the front end stuff, mm -hmm. uh, maintaining the website and and maintaining social media, because that's a lot. It's a lot of time just to be updating constantly but that's what really that's what's gotten the reach that we've had so far and that's what's gotten us customers especially as an e-commerce only business where we don't other than the once a year trade show you know we don't we aren't able to connect with people on a yeah and we do it all in-house too like that's the other thing we don't we're not paying somebody we're not paying a website developer we we do all our own website building um, all our marketing, all yeah. the designs, the logos. I mean, you, everything. That's mostly Lexi. Lexi that's, does pretty much all well, of that stuff. That's all. But it's uh, all in house. Yeah. Direct know? direct answer to that question. That's all skills that that I I've picked up along the way because I see something, and it's okay. We need to make this happen. So that's the beautiful thing about living in 2017 and having the internet is so much of it you can teach yourself. And, yeah. Um. You know. Yeah. So absolutely. That's a huge part of it. Is seeing seeing the ultimate goal that we want to reach and just learning what I need to learn to get there. Um, yeah, definitely. I, I would say in terms of the, the business skills, it's def we're, we're definitely learning and we're learning every day. You know, that's yeah. the thing about it. We're not, we are, we are making more mistakes than we're having success, which is, you know, how you learn, how you grow, I think. Um, so, you know, the skills are definitely acquired <laughs> over time here. If I could just add, because I, I feel like I'm saying this all the time. So, for instance, you have a question on Finale or Sibelius. And, of course, it's fine. You know, a student asks. You tell them exactly how to do it so they can get it done. But if they were to go do it on their own, like let's say, I don't know, you're trying to learn how to cross-staff a treble and bass clef uh, rhythm together. So you got to find the special tool. you got to find the cross-staff feature, and you got to click in the right spot so it activates the right handles so that you can do the cross-staff. If you know that, it's really easy, and if someone tells you it's really easy and you'll know how to do it from then on, but if you don't know how to do it and you try to figure it out yourself, you're going to learn so many other things along the way. <laughs> like, yeah, it's going to take 10 times as long, but you're going to know the software so much better. I get annoyed when, I don't know, Teachers make too big a deal out of building websites or 
um, lear learning software that's meant to be easy. It's like, no, man, these are, you know, th those website creating softwares are meant for anybody to be able to use them. The whole point is you don't need a class on them, right. you know, and you guys are the perfect example. Like, yeah, you just dive in and do it and you learn so yeah. much by diving in and doing it. It just takes a lot of yeah. time, but then you like, you you have it mastered. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's, and that's, that's the most important thing for sure. Yeah. 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 Agreed. Yeah. I'm yeah, not sure what else to add to that. Just cause like, I completely on. agree with you. Yeah, it's the best, that's the best way to describe it. That's yeah. a great analogy. It's perfect. Oh, sure. Thanks. 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 How about another, you got another Facebook question there, Ben? Sure. Sure. Um, so continuing along with this, Sort of where did you come from? Uh, we had quite a few people. Sean McWilliams, Matt Wyckoff, Sean, uh, Chris Nat Natal, Randall Rudolph would all like to know about what's next for Artifact Percussion. Are there any plans to expand into marching percussion, Baroque timpani mallets, or other areas? Do you have any plans to increase your artist roster? You might have yeah, to quit I, jobs. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I, I, I laugh at that a little bit because because uh, Randy has been asking. I, I stopped counting how many times he's asking us about the Baroque timpani mounts. Because um, he's like, oh, he's all about us making like a line of Baroque, like old Baroque wooden timpani mounts. Is he really something, snarky yeah. about it when he asks? Yeah, he is. Yeah, he is. Uh, yeah. And I, we really want to do it, but it's a, it's a, um, it's, it's a, uh, it's a, it's a time it's a time and end of money thing for sure because yeah. you know we're we are um and before we before we uh answer the question about what's coming next or what we're planning on expanding into i think it's important to kind of address you know how we pick and choose what we're going to expand into and what we're going to do next go ahead yeah um yeah kind of going back to the previous question to um are the best uh, taking from um like almost a Silicon Valley approach, we are essentially a lean startup. Um, so we have a literal, we, we have a certain amount of money to put towards new products and we have a literal list of, of what's coming next. And we kind of prioritize what's on that list based on what we think is going to get the, the, most return for us so that we can then put that back into whatever the next thing is on the list. So that's sort of, that's basically how we decide what's coming next. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's, and, and a lot of it too is in terms of like customer requests. Like we just, we, we just added another model of Merma mounts because we've had a lot of people requesting for uh, hardness in between two of the models we currently are offering. So a lot of it is also based on what we're, what we're getting feedback from our customers and from our current roster of artists. Um, to get more specific, then hopefully that does that is that clear enough on how we decide to do what we're doing. Cool. Um, to answer the question a little more specifically in terms of uh, like marching percussion stuff, um, yeah, we are. We definitely are are working on some things. And one of our artists, uh, Matt Wyckoff, um, he works with the Cadets. He's a great guy, killer player. Um, he's helping to design some of our marching um, implements, some like front ensemble stuff and. And things like that. So we are we are working towards it, um, hoping over this next year that we'll have some things to start putting out there and kind of beta testing um, here and there with some, maybe some school programs or some independent groups. Yeah, um, that's a whole. It's a whole other world. Yeah, it's a whole other market. It's a whole other market and a whole other world in terms of. Um, and, and for me, it's one that I'm familiar with because I I marched, I did the WGI thing and uh, and all that stuff. So I'm familiar with the, with the marching world, um, and. Uh, um, it's a it's just a whole nother market um, and one that we don't uh, have the, the the capital in place to dive headfirst into yet. So it's going to be a slow process, but we are working on it. Yeah, for sure. Megan can give you consultation. <laughs> yes, <laughs> she knows yeah, well, the world. For, for the episode, I'm just yeah, I know, Megan. You marched uh, Santa Clara, right? I did. Yeah. yeah. And I'm just sitting here thinking, like a few weeks ago, we had Ron Samuels from Marimba One on. Like, I'm pretty sure Ron's trying to get into the uh, DCI market. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, and that's. I mean, I, I'm surprised it's he hasn't. He, he didn't do it 10 or 15 years ago. You know, he's always kind of very much marketed towards the towards the concert player. Um, not not that his mouths can't be used on the field because there's. Well, a lot that was of... a total joke. He's definitely not. Oh, was it? Oh, is he? <laughs> Oh, I didn't know. I didn't. Oh, I didn't know. I wasn't sure. I don't know. Maybe if he was or not. 
Um, but I'm surprised well, he has it. Honestly, talk about just it. it's such a it is a lucrative. Um, it, it definitely is a lucrative um, um, aspect of percussion, just because it's of, only getting bigger. Too. Yeah, because it, it's it yeah. is only getting bigger. The indoor thing and the outdoor thing is only getting bigger, and you know these these groups tend to go through stuff quickly too. You know, so they're always constantly buying. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's great. And, and companies like Innovative and Vic have always kind of had the market very cornered in that because they have such an extensive, expansive line and. I have so much great gear to offer to these groups. So, um, you know, it's hard to, it's, it's definitely hard. It would be a lot harder to break into that, that realm. Sure. Do you think it's smart to design gear that will break after every two <laughs> hours of marching? Definitely not. No, 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 no. Absolutely I don't know. Not. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Who knows? But does that, does that, I hope that answers the question. Was there another part to that question too? Was there something else about that? what we're planning on having as the next the next big thing i guess i don't know artists. um oh, oh the artist thing yeah for for our artists uh maybe you can help speak to this a little bit too but in terms of in terms of people who want to use our gear and like and, and endorse our products um the only minimum requirement we have is that you have you know you have completed a bachelor's degree in in music or you have some kind of equivalent performance experience of some kind um, you know, you need to be doing some kind of freelancing or teaching or, or, or playing, et cetera. Um, yeah. I mean, then you may have noticed that our artist roster isn't, you know, it, it isn't like, you know, um, Vic or, or, or Promart. Um, cause we kind of just, I don't know. We're all about kind of getting, getting more of the common man and lady percussionist, um, you know, cause it, and it's, it, it works for us. Because I don't know what do you, in terms of the relationship. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, and the the cool thing about it is too is like all of the, all the people who are currently artists with us are all people who have come to us expressing that interest. Like we we started doing the artist program because we were getting so many requests from people to do it, um, and they all you know re just really love the the image, the vibe, the customer service, you know everything that we're doing with Artifact. You know they're a hundred percent on board with it. Um, so that's kind of what pushed us over the edge because we were really hesitant about it. We're like, well, we're not there yet. This is going to be like five or six more years until we even think about trying to add artists and giving them, you know, endorsements and trying to help and, and giving them good discounts on gear and all this other stuff and and throwing, uh, sending stuff to them when they're holding clinics and events and sponsoring things like that, you know. But we were able to make it work and it's working so far. So, and everybody seems to be very happy, at least. And yeah, yeah. They're, they're all very much, we really love all of our artists because they're they're all they share the same sentiments that, yeah. that we do in terms of what we want to see for the percussion community going into the future. So. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, because we're all about building, helping to continue to build a, a more inclusive environment. That's one of the words we use a lot is, is being a lot more inclusive. I think, and I don't know how you guys feel about it, but I think we've, I've kind of always felt like there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of exclusivity in, in our art form, you know, that people kind of push that as a, as a as a good thing like being exclusive you know um and i'm not sure that i really think that that's a good thing especially for for our art form or for any art form really um so you know we we kind of push that and um and and we stand by it too you know because we, we want to see it because at the end of the day we we're doing what we do because we we really love to do it you know we didn't we didn't decide to start doing this because we're like we can make a ton of money doing this yeah. <laughs> like we're because we are we are we are just we are just starting to turn a profit um, from a financial yeah. standpoint. You know, we are just starting to. I mean, we've been breaking even for a long time, um, and so it, you know, if anybody thinks if if you're thinking about starting your own business, know that you're going to be getting into it. It's going to take a long time. I mean, Casey, you know, you're, you're basically you're basically running your own business as a <laughs> as a composer. You know, yeah, um, sure. It's, it's essentially what it is, um, and you, it takes a long time. It takes a long time to to build it up and people people expect some kind of turnaround right after two or three months so they're like oh well forget this i don't want to do this anymore you know you gotta you gotta be in it for the long haul you really have to be in it for the long haul and i've definitely said that especially about publishing before is you have to be really patient and you have to let it go little mm -hmm. by little and we'll we'll get email inquiries from young people that say so what kind of awesome you know Ten thousand plus dollar machine should I buy to print all my music? And we say like, well, yes. how many copies do you expect to sell? And they're like, well, none yet. It's like, well, then you're not ready. F don't worry about that. Yet. Yeah, you right. know. So yeah. 
Yeah, we talk about this kind of stuff all the time because we've seen it happen to other people. It's like you go and you take out a huge business loan to really get some capital flowing. And before you know it, you're closing up shop and you're in all kinds of crazy debt. Yeah. And you know, that's a road that we refuse to go down. You know, we're not going to go down that road. Yeah, it um, just seems like you should f- be able to have both hands on every step along yeah, the way. Yeah. You know, Absolutely. like you guys are fully engrossed in the step you're in. Like basically, you should always feel pretty dang hands on about everything that's happening. Yep. Yeah. 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 Yep. Ben, do you have a question? Yeah. So I, the topic of timpani mallets came up, and I was puttering through your website. And first of all, I'm really interested. I'm going to try some of your like xylophone and Glock mallets that have the kind of small handles on them. I think those like for magic flute or something would be really nice. But I saw that you've like partnered with JG Percussion for some timpani mallets. Could you tell us yes. about that partnership? And absolutely, yeah. Well, first, let me start by saying that uh, Jason has been really fantastic to us. When we first kind of started doing our thing, um, you know, he reached out to us right away and really kind of wanted to take us under his wing. And he's been a great mentor and a great friend because um, he, you know, he saw some of our stuff, and I sent him a whole bunch of it, and. He immediately kind of fell in love with it. He's like, this stuff's great. I love it. It's awesome. You know, what can I do to help you guys? Um, and I said, well, let's work on something together. Um, so we um, we uh, made snare drum sticks for him. So he, he has two models of snare drum sticks uh, that we kind of rebooted for him and slightly redesigned from models he used to sell. Uh, so and, and in return, we designed some timpani mallets to our specs that he makes for us. And... Uh, we buy from him wholesale and resell them. Um, cool. So that's how that partnership works, and it's a, so it's vice vice versa, kind of an even exchange between the sticks and the and the timpani mallets. If you want to look at it that way. And is that a is that just a retail relationship, or does the does the name branding on the stick change? Uh, it it does uh, it does change on the stick. Yeah, correct. Yeah. So we, we we like we call our collaboration is called um, so the stuff that we, we make for him we call uh, JG by Artifact. And the stuff uh-huh. he makes for us is Artifact by JG. Yeah, yeah, of course. So That's we kind of have a, a reverse flip-flopped kind of uh, branding with that. Cool. Which is cool. So yeah. then one, day you guys will, one day you guys will grow and, like, buy him out. <laughs> just Maybe. Sink, I mean... <laughs> just sink him. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, uh, it, yeah, it, it, would be, it, would be, it would be cool to, um, to, uh, to, to eventually be able to... Um, m- merge with somebody in the future. I mean, one of the things too that we love to do, and that we we are we are doing, we have some other collabs in the works right now. I don't know if I can 100% put them out there in the public yet, but one of the things that we really want to do with other small business is um, is make stuff with them and to come up with stuff together. Because uh, I really think we're stronger together in that sense, you know. Um, and that's and and it proved to work really well with Jason. And we have some other things. Um, in the works and some other things that we're planning, um, but uh, you know that's because that's something we don't. I don't think we see enough of in our industry either. Because everybody's always trying to really compete with each other and, but silently competing with each other. You know, they don't put it out there that they're competing with each other. Yeah, uh, sure, sure. <laughs> but um, but uh, y- you know what I mean. So I think I think that you know the more we can work together on stuff and the more we can uh, kind of combine forces and help to bring quality stuff to players' hands is better for everybody. Yeah, of course. Uh, yeah, yeah, well said. A collaborative uh, of small makers in the future. Yeah, and we've <laughs> talked about that too. Like actually trying to start a a, a collective of some, like a small business percussion collective. Um, that's something we've we've been dreaming about for a while. So maybe we'll be able to make that a real thing kind of in the future. So. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Neat idea. Well, speaking of small companies turned very successful, Megan, you're going to talk about. The Halo Company, right? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I, I can, I didn't, I read about your, your business and your projects, and I had been wanting to present on this topic for a little while, because our steel band here at the University of Missouri took a field trip after our concert. We went to Farmington, Missouri, which is about three hours away from Columbia. It's in just south of St. Louis. And there, there is a, a former steel pen making company called Pantheon Steel. And um, the owner of that 
tunes are steel pans. That was kind of our connection to it. I thought he still made steel pans. He does not anymore. <laughs> now they only make uh, the halo, and which is kind of a hand pan. And so I was really inspired by this trip and, and this, this guy's story and the company's story. And uh, after visiting after visiting them, and then when I was at PASIC, I was having a conversation with someone about the hand pan. I had said halo, or actually I had said hung drum. And this person corrected me and said, actually, the correct term is hand pan. And I've heard just so many different terms thrown around for this type of instrument. And for, the, for those of you listening, what I'm talking about is the thing that looks like the top of a steel pan or a steel drum, but, but basically flipped inside out and it kind of looks like a UFO and you play it with your hands and there's usually like five or seven pitches on it. And it's a rather, rather relatively new, but extremely popular instrument. So that inspired me to look a little further about what is the history of this term and the history of the instrument in general. So before talking about, about the halo, I'm just going to talk about the hand pan in general. And this is directly from Wikipedia. Uh, so according to Wikipedia, handpan is a term for a group of musical instruments resulting from a growing, uh, growing worldwide interest in the hong, an instrument invented and built by the company Pan Art uh, in Hongbao. So this term first appeared in 2007, the term handpan, on the website of American steel pan producer Pantheon Steel. So these two are already connected immediately. And the term was used to describe its own development of a new instrument, which was launched as an alternative to the hung drum. So this term eventually made its way into discussions in this really popular hung music forum that's now defunct. But there's a new forum that was founded in 2009 called handpan.org. And so this term handpan sort of started seeing wide circulation because of this forum. So now it's kind of the term uh, for this instrument. However, it's controversial. So critics point out that the hung, which all makers of hand pans use as a standard model, is essentially defined through its difference from the steel pan. So the term pan is used for the national culture of the steel bands of Trinidad and Tobago, but the hung is not really, there's no relationship to it, really. It does, you know, kind of look like it a little bit and maybe resemble it, but it does not, it is not connected to it uh, in, in, in any way. So supporters stress the necessity of a generic term. So they advocate for this term hand pan that's suitable and it's well understood, um, but it's it's been conventionalized among those who are interested in these kinds of instruments. Another term that's used is pantam, pantam, and it's mm. said to be a combination of the words pan and gadam. And the gadam is a traditional instrument in India. For those of you who know, it kind of, you know, you put your hand on the side and on the top in two different places. And so some of those techniques can be used on the hand pan. So pantam, I had never heard that before, but I haven't heard that they one, do yeah. catch on. Yeah. So the hung makers of pan art, they also reject the expression hand pan. And the founders of pan art, Felix Rohner and Sabrina Scherer, they say, quote, to state it clearly and precisely, we do not make percussion instruments, hand pans, or hung drums, end quote. Because people probably ask them all the time, can I yes. get one of those halo drums from you? Yes, exactly, exactly. Yeah. So the first four instruments that are kind of termed hand pan were in 2000, the first one is 2007, Kaisa, C-A-I-S-A, -S -A, Bells in 2009, Halo, 2009, Space Drum in 2009. So it really started just absolutely super popular in 2009. Halo were the, was the first company, or they're not, the, the company is Pantheon Steel, but the Halo is the first one to be made in the United States. But today there are so many builders and I actually have this kind of cool map that I found on Google Maps where it shows where all these hand pan makers live. And the instruments are all different. They vary in material, manufacturing technique, shape, sound, and quality. So when we were at Pantheon, uh, the owner was telling us that he has uh, builders that are kind of helping him make pans, but they're they're basically prototypes. So they're, they're different offshoots. So they're the halo, but I can't remember what they call them exactly. Halo, 
prototype or I don't remember. No, it's not prototype. Um, I can't remember. I'll see if I can find that. But so it's not exactly a halo, but it's very similar because these people have been coached by by Kyle. So it seems like this term. Yeah, go ahead. It seems like anytime there's an instrument played with your hand, it's like, mm-hmm. oh, is that a tambourine? Well, kind of. It's like so it's always so muddy. And here we have a chance to start fresh and they're making it muddy. It's still muddy. It's still yeah, just as exactly. muddy as everything else. Yeah, exactly. Well, to to tell you a little bit more about Pantheon Steel, so one company, the first company to make this hung drum or this hand pan in the United States um, is Pantheon Steel, and it's formed, founded by Kyle Cox. He's a steel pan maker and uh, accomplished tuner. He founded the company in 2004, which, of course, is before this became started taking off in 2009. So it started as a steel pan making company. And it basically has evolved into an industry-leading hand pan maker with its flagship instrument being the Halo. Here's a little quote from Kyle. A vision, a company, a calling. Pantheon Steel is a book with many chapters, some closed and some still to be written. As the pages turn, its voice is getting clearer, stronger, and more confident, more itself. So to give you a brief history of Pantheon Steel, what they were doing between 2004 and 2009... Um, he started in 2004, Steel Pan. 2005, he partnered with this engineer named Jim Dusen, and he had 54 years of experience working in the manufacturing industry. And they started thinking of new projects together, and they basically reinvented the manufacture of traditional steel pans. They invented a new forming method, and they later patented that method. Something that Kyle told us when we were on the tour is is that his interest is more in the research and the innovation of this art form rather than just mass producing. So um, that also reminds me when, when you guys were talking, you know, a very similar, like very interested in the research and the history and, and where it's going next um, rather than just mass producing something. So in 2006, Kyle's mother passed away And he was kind of searching for a way to create an instrument that would help him um, meditate and contemplate um, her loss and also as a tribute to her. So in 2007, he had a calling, basically, and a phone call. (laughs) The phone call was from a filmmaker named Kim Rochelli from California, and she encouraged him to start making a hand-played steel drum. And it was akin to this innovative new instrument that she had heard that was made in Switzerland. So Kyle was like, hmm, should I do that? I don't know. That, you know, clearly takes his business in a very different direction. He thought about it for a few days and he decided that this instrument would actually be the tribute to his mother and the tribute he'd been searching for. So in a way, Pantheon Steel kind of found its mission through this through this call, this phone call and this uh, subsequent calling So he and Jim together modified the equipment that they already had to be able to handle steel sheets rather than the steel drum barrels that they were working with before for the steel pans. And they started designing uh, how they would make this pan from 2007, 2009, 2009. It delivered its last steel pan. (laughs) And in that same week, he had a a waiting list of nearly 2,000 people and they delivered their very first halo. Now, Kyle told us on the tour that that list exists well beyond his lifetime, that they make 40 to 50 pans a month Mm -hmm. and he'll never catch up. And that didn't seem to bother him. I was like, wow, why don't you have more people? Why don't you get a bigger place? You know, I'm thinking about, and, and he's not interested in that. So he is interested in training new artisans and people around the world who are interested in doing this to use his methods and his models. Um, But as far as, the hand pans that he's creating, the halo, he's just going to keep keep doing it. And then the long time, at the same time, he's going to reserve his time for research and experiments to be able to be more effective in producing. Well, I see you have to enter a lottery, they call it, to even buy one. Yes. Yeah, so, so they it, it says on their website they do these uh, surprise sales. So if they advertise one okay, we're deciding to sell this one for whatever reason, you can hop on and for, I I think it's first come, first serve. But otherwise, yeah, you got to get on this lottery. Yeah. 
It's so crazy. So popular. It's really insane how it's just actually exploded. Casey, do you have a lottery for your publications company? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. That's a... <laughs> can't, can't print a pass, though. Yeah. How much should that lottery ticket cost? Maybe, maybe a nickel? <laughs> Sorry, man. So, no, it's okay. So um, his, his partner, uh, this engineer, Jim, passed away in 2016. So Pantheon Steel is still working to carry on his legacy and the, their tradition of excellence and continuing to innovate in his memory. But um, but that was that was definitely hard for Kyle, I think, to lose his his business partner and his his musical partner, his 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 artist partner, you know. And so anyway, the facilities were it was amazing tour. He spent so much time with us. They've got so many experiments going on. And it was really cool to meet the you know, to see it in action. Things were definitely happening. And uh, while we were there different parts we got to see different parts of the process there's a sh like a little showroom where you can try out the different instruments and also while we were there there was uh, a visiting computer engineer from germany who he had met at a handpan conference and they're working together he created some tuning software that's become the standard in in tuning steel pens now and he they're working together on 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 new ways to program their machines and things like that. But also I had no idea what to expect when we arrived there. Cause I said, is this going to be a giant factory? Is this going to be in his basement? I just had no idea. And it's a small place right off the highway, but there's, they're doing so much in there. It's, it's, it's really crazy what they're able to do in such a small space, it's a, but it's very, you know, um, he's very committed to making sure they're putting out the absolute best thing. He oversees every part of the process. He tunes them in the end. And it's really incredible. But these, this community of people that plays hand pans is continuing to grow. And you can get the instruments from, from different makers if you're not fortunate enough to win Kyle's lottery. But there are also conventions and gatherings all over the world. They held one there at Pantheon Steel a few years ago. There was a cool photo book of, of pictures from that, that event. But it seems like a really cool community. The yeah, video, sure. that's the like, video you shared is really cool. Yeah. The how they make them. How they um, make them. Yeah, yeah it's, it's really well website. done. I was I was really sold. I think they they just need to put a clause in the lottery description. You cannot buy if you're a hippie. <laughs> <laughs> and and if you have one and you become a hippie, you need to surrender it to <laughs> That that's sorry, Aaron. What were you saying? You probably have no. Well, what I was just going to gonna say. say was, I mean, we're we're all percussionists, and you know that that's just one example of many where it's a whole nother world. Like that that community is a whole nother community. That this whole like this whole like meditative sound production community, people who are like into the into gongs and everything too. It's just like this whole other world of 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 musicians and yeah. like and and what they do with their music. You know, it's it's just. It's it's crazy because I mean like what you just that's a whole lot of new information for me too. I no. I'm familiar with the drums. I've seen them before. I've heard them, but you know to get some of the backstory and the history, I had no idea. You know. Yeah, <laughs> so, exactly. And sound therapy. I did a segment on that a, yeah. a few weeks ago, but similar to that, it's like there are yeah, there's so many things that are kind of on the outside of our not the outside of our field, but that are just kind of subsets of our field. It's so interesting. It's exciting. You know. Yeah. So men are like very I, I have big a question, and you may not know the answer to this, but when I first sort of encountered these hand pans or hung drums or whatever, they they're all tuned to some sort of very user friendly scale, like they're it's a pentatonic scale or some sort of like I don't know, like a Dorian mode or something like that. Is there a, are these used in music therapy at all? Because it seems like like it's just begging for that. Because you could take a group of these like into a nursing home and people that aren't musicians can sit down and play music together without needing to read music, without needing to know anything about rhythm. Like literally if you just roll random notes on it, it sounds really good. Sounds yeah. Good. And that was what Kyle said. He said they are used in, in music therapy, but Kyle also said that that, you know, that's a huge mission of the instrument is to provide something that someone who has no prior experience can, can go up to and, and make a sound off of immediately. And of course there are super advanced players out there and people who specialize in this instrument now and you know you can there's really advanced methods of playing but also when you just hit it 
you, if you have, you know, you can just use your finger and you can hit it and you can make a beautiful sound. And they do make them in different scales as well. So, but yeah, they're usually pentatonic. Aaron, you were going to say something. I think we talked over you. Oh, no, it's okay. I was just, I was kind of just going to add to that too. It, it's, 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 it's just a very accessible thing. And I think that's why it, that industry as it's, it's being its own thing on the side, like you said, it's kind of like on the outskirts of what we know to be traditional percussion. Right. But at, at the same respect, it's but like that helps. Yeah. Right. Percussion. Well, that, that helps yeah. to make it right. way more accessible, you know, that, and it opens up the world of what we do to lots of other people that, you know, coming back the whole thing, it, it makes it more inclusive. You know, it's not, right. you can, you can do it even though you're not, you know, traditionally classically trained, so to speak. Exactly. I mean, it's kind of the same function as drum circles, you know, in a way. And I've started adding that as another class for my percussion methods class. I add that as a class for my studio class, too, because I think sometimes as percussionists or as elitists, we're like, oh, what's that drum circle that's happening over there? You know, that's not that's <laughs> the hippies. But it, it is a way to it's a bridge for us to reach all these other uh, all these people and then, and, you know, yeah, to teach people about what we do. The more the I was better. wondering if the more the better, exactly. I was I was wondering if one of those terms was going to be happy drum. I don't know. Do you know happy drums? H A P I. No, I thought that was a joke. Oh no, yeah, those H-A-P-I, are like similar. That's a that's a drum also, and it's a hand metal hand pan. I thought, yeah, H A P I drum. You've, uh, probably, you've probably seen these before. They're I much see. simpler, much cheaper. And they fit in your lap. They're smaller. They're very similar. They're like a diatonic scale or a pentatonic scale. And they're, they tend to be in E or in G or in A or whatever. We actually got one recently for a piece with the choir. And I learned in Taiwan when our student Kai Polan took us to the big gong factory, they also make those drums. And it's very easy to see this if you see them. And this is hence why they're much cheaper than, say, one of the hong drums. But... Uh, it's just the two ends of a propane tank. So you think of a propane tank, it's like nice, thick, evenly thick metal, and you cut out the center segment and take the two end caps and weld them together, and then you cut slits in one of the ends and you have the happy drum. Yeah, and it's like, so it's like tongues, right? Basically yeah, tongues. Yeah, right, it's a metal. Yeah, yeah, exactly, it's a metal tongue oh, yeah. drum. My colleague has one of those, uh, a new colleague this year, who's, who's my actually my office neighbor. He's like, i got to show you this drum I got. And he thought it was a hung drum or something, and it was one of these tongue drums. And it's made out of two woks. Two what? Woks, like Chinese woks. Like oh, cooking. yeah, sure. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Isn't that crazy? Yeah, absolutely. That was pretty good. Yeah, yeah, I think they sound good. Yeah, the one we have sounds great. Hey, how about one more Facebook question to end with something from Aaron and Lexi. Do you got anything handy, Ben? Yeah, sure. Uh, I think this is, I guess after what we were just talking about, here's a kind of nice one to end on from Alyssa Resch. She says, what kind of ways do you guys hope to give back to the percussion community or anyone in need? Oh, great. great. Yeah. (laughs) Um, Well, first shout out to Alyssa Resch because she's a really good friend of mine. So she'll appreciate that. Um, Go ahead. Do you want to go ahead? Do you want to start? I mean, go ahead. That's something we've thought about for the last three years since we started this. Um, I mean, one of the end goals is to have a uh, a scholarship program set up. Um, I mean, we haven't worked out the details for that yet because we're not there yet. Um, but uh, a company, any of you guys know Olin Rogers? No. He's a YouTuber. Yeah. Yeah, he's a YouTuber. He, he has a... He has a uh, he has a TV show coming out actually finally after so many years later this year yeah it was a cartoon but, uh, yeah he he has an, yeah. he has an apparel company so yeah. it's t-shirts but and uh, part of that he do, he incorporates a scholarship um, program for I mean I don't know who basically anyone can apply for it. yeah it's arts based though right. so it's like filmmakers um, or musicians I think can, yeah but can apply. we definitely want to yeah. do. Yeah, something like that. And, you know, giving back to the community, too, um, you know, because like, going back to one of the first things we talked about at the beginning of the the uh, episode here uh, was um, drawing things from other industries. And uh, all of uh, we just kind of launched some apparel that were we started selling a little bit ago and we we donate all of the proceeds to different nonprofits. So each different designs are going to different nonprofits unrelated to the music field. 
um, that that we kind of feel share the same values that we do that we incorporate into um, yeah, we, what we do as a yeah. percussion business. That's awesome. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and I, part of it too, I think we also like to try and extend a hand and kind of build bridges between different. Arts, yeah, for sure, for different sure. Different forms and different um, different industries. Yeah, so. absolutely. And we do, and we do, we do a solid amount of giveaways for for stuff that we that we make and we sell. Um, we also we, we also try to I I don't like to let any kind of price be an issue. I, I like to I work with, with customers on price all the time for things. Um, you know I'm I'm all about getting stuff into people's hands who need it and and uh, for some people who come from you know lower income situations. Yeah. I've we, yeah we, we we know how hard it is yeah. to, to be poor percussionist. Absolutely so. yeah and I'll and I'll I'll work with you and 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 we do on on the regular. Um, so and that's that's because that's one of the things that, that you know like like what Alex just said it's it's important to us because we know what that feels like you know mm. we're not we don't we don't come from having an abundance of, of resources you know we kind of have to fight for everything that we're we're doing and everything that we've done up to this point so um, we kind of like to be on the on that side of the fence in terms of helping out those who, who need it sure is the well speaking of exactly that is your foundation still around is it still called the Make It Foundation. Yeah, so it still it still exists. We're well, kind of it's kind yeah. of off on the sidelines at the moment. It, we're we're trying to tie it back into what we're doing with artifacts. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, when when we started it, I mean, and that's another example of is it just starting any kind of venture really is it failed. Um, you know, we didn't we were we weren't able to raise enough money. We weren't able to to ha supply enough funding just from us um you know and that's 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 part of the learning process is yeah. um you know it, it it failed we didn't get enough interest um and, you know and and understandably but, but uh but yeah so and but it, and it was it was weird too because when we started artifact we saw it was a completely different uh side of the coin i mean we just when we started artifact we immediately got great response and a lot of interest people wanted to buy mallets so and I'm, I'm i think about that a lot trying to figure out what that difference is but um but yeah so now we're really trying to maybe someday we will bring back make it foundation as its own uh entity but uh -huh. probably just going to start incorporating what we wanted to do with that into artifact yeah that's a better way of saying it yeah. well and if, she's well, always more just here. If I could just disagree, you know, what I saw is it, it didn't fail, you know? I mean, just because it's, you know, as far as I know, you guys provided some instruments to some kids who needed instruments. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. I mean, you provided, I mean, no, you provided yeah. instruments, you, you, you did what you tried to do, which was you, you don't, yeah. I, was blown, I was blown away. I was telling Laurel all about you guys after our visit. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the, I guess, for the listeners, you know, Aaron had me out. Aaron and Lexi had me out as a, a guest artist for a fundraiser, and I was blown awesome. away. Like two grad students have made their own foundation, and they're like getting instruments into kids' hands who were uh, sick, right? Yeah, we. I mean, we did uh, on a very small scale. Yeah, we we did a. Uh... Provide instruments. To yeah, I guess it's not. I, I guess it's not totally fair to say that that it yeah, failed. It's just. I, I agree with that. <laughs> um, you know, I, I I think moving forward with it, we kind of realized that it wasn't moving forward in a totally sustainable fashion, sure. which is kind of where the artifact yeah, thing kind of sprung from. That right. artifact kind of rose from the ashes of that. I guess I could kind of yeah, say. Yeah, because we did. I mean, we had to put make it to the side because yeah. we just couldn't yeah. keep it going. And but. we're and we're and we're pull, we're bringing a lot of the same aspects of what we were doing with that into artifact. Uh -huh. I kind of I personally am kind of looking at them as one and the same because like I said in terms of what we want to do and how we want to give back um, with what we're doing with artifact, it's it's on the same it's 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 on the same level. It's it's yeah. in the, it's in the same arena. Um, it's just it's just a more uh, um, uh, What's the word I'm looking for? It's 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 a more accessible way of doing it, you know. Because when you're when you're when you're just what we what we had found with just the foundation approach rather than the business approach is that it's really hard to get people to give you money for something that you're trying to convince them to care about, you know. Yeah. Um, and and it's also 
because we weren't uh, because we were brand new and yeah. not established. Right. It, it, yeah. It's it, yeah. and I absolutely understand that it's hard. Um, it's hard to donate to something where you're not sure where that money's going to go. Yeah. Um, and, and 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 as and as things have been progressing with Artifact, you know, being able to provide people with a service and have um, you know revenue coming in from that, um, we're able to use that. You know, accordingly yeah, to yeah. to help give back. You know, that's. I mean, that's, that's, yeah, I think. You know, that's and that's that's one of the reasons. Another reason where Artifact kind of came from because we were looking for a way to, to make that work. Like, how can we how can we incorporate a lot of the things that we really love and put them into, into one thing that that other people will be interested in, you know, um, because there's, it's it's very easy to just kind of come up with things and to do other stuff that nobody cares about. It's it's really easy to do that. Yeah. Um, and, and, and we, we spend a lot of time just trying to figure out and, and kind of come up with what we think is going to be the best for everybody, you know, yeah. and not, not, not just for artifact, but for, for, for everybody involved with artifact, our, our artifact family, as we call them, you know, all the people who have supported us along the way. Um, if that kind of helps explain it, maybe, maybe yeah. a very long way yeah. of going about it, but. Um, and it's all—it's all just one big work in progress too. It's, it really is, and it's kind of, and the fact that we're growing is great. You know, I can't really it's, complain about that at all. It's really cool, man. Like, yeah, Lexi and Aaron, congratulations on Artifact, Thanks. and and I was so I I thought make it was totally cool. I think you guys should be so proud of that. Even even if you yeah. didn't, yeah. you know, yeah, even if it's, it's even if it just came and went, it's like, hey, you know, you come and go, you help people when you can and you guys did and that's i think that's really special yeah it's not gone forever i can i can i can say that and we were actually just talking about it it was like not last night but the night before i think we were out and we were talking about it it's it's not gone forever it's just um it's it's, it's still there and, and it will resurface with artifacts that's for, that's for sure i can Very guarantee cool. that yeah well you guys thank awesome. you so much for joining us on episode 124 laurel came in just at the end there so hey laurel yeah hey everybody <laughs> yeah she she came in just in time to say bye so thanks for thanks laurel ben and megan absolutely guys thanks for having us it's thank great you. to meet you yeah yes. you're very welcome you guys thank you so much lexi fiorini and aaron trumbore man an artifact percussion congratulations and we'll we'll chat with you guys again i'm sure excellent thank you wonderful yeah. So Happy holidays cool. to everybody. Happy holidays. Yeah, yeah. Catch you all later. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Take Bye. Care.